It's been a great summer for rainfall throughout most of Eastern Australia and the Mitchell grass country especially has had well above average rainfall. G'day David. G'day John. How are you? Very well, how are you? Good to see you. Great to see you. Yeah, yeah. here yeah. we are in this magnificent Mitchell grass country. We are, we are indeed. And isn't it magnificent country? Especially at the moment after the, the well above average summer that we had. I guess one of the really interesting things about Mitchell grass is that it's, it's endemic to Australia. So it only grows in Australia on these, these heavy clay soils and very, very productive. So it's a perennial grass and particularly by the dry season, middle of, the, middle of our winter, it's a really good standover feed. It's almost like a standing haystack for cattle and sheep production. So that's, that's one of the key values really of Mitchell grass itself. It's that long lived perennial. Individual plants can live 20, 30 years quite easily. But Mitchell grass is also uh, pretty important for our um, native animals and so on as well, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, there's quite a few species of dunnarts and, and small, I guess, mouse-like Australian marsupials that live exclusively in, in the open grasslands of, of Mitchell grass country. And budgerigars and just these big flocks of green and blue budgies flying through is really stunning. Yeah. So this really is a, a, a key rangeland type in Australia. It's important for livestock production and it is important for our biodiversity and so on as well. Yes. So John, one of the key things in terms of managing Mitchell grass is at the end of the grazing season to have left about 15 to 20 centimetres of stubble height. If it's grazed flat down to the ground, then the grass has to reshoot from the crown. And it can do that, but it takes more rain. So it's less, it's less efficient for it mm. to actually respond. Another important thing that we're learning more recently is the value of spelling country, so of resting the country, especially when it's first coming away from those, those initial summer rains. Well, uh, David, um, we've been talking to a lot of managers and so on about how they manage for climate variability, but um, how does a plant do it in, uh, in this incredible variable climate that we deal with? Actually, let's go back to the, to the lab, John, because what I've got there is a Mitchell grass tussock on display, roots and all, and we can, we can have a good look at the mechanisms of, of it coping with drought and that sort of thing back in the lab. Well, that sounds fabulous. Let's, okay. let's do that, David. Let's go. Yeah, good. So come through, John. Thanks, David. Well, what have we got here? This looks fascinating. So whilst normally we can walk around the paddock and see what's happening above the ground, getting a real sense of what the roots are doing below ground is, is quite difficult. The only published information was from the 1940s of what was happening below ground. So we grew some Mitchell grass plants in large pots under controlled conditions so that we could then wash all the soil away from the roots and, and really see how much root activity and growth you get in a, in a single season. So this particular plant was grown from a seedling over one wet season. Quite amazing how well it can establish given, given good moisture. But these roots just really keep coming down and tapping into that deep moisture and that's what really keeps the Mitchell grass plant alive during our dry winters and really importantly during a drought. As well as those really deep roots it has a concentration of roots in the top about 20 centimetres and they can tap into the, the shallower moisture following rain, rainfall events. So it's this dual root system, these two layers of roots that really enable the Mitchell grass plant to survive a drought and then respond quickly to rainfall. Other parts of the world which have had more reliable rainfall, as they move into a more variable situation, then I think the lessons of, of quickly reducing your livestock numbers as, as the pasture is declining, coming into drought, so as you've got feed shortages, to rather than trying to feed everything, to actually take those livestock off so that you're, you're protecting your, your resources, 
uh, by not having overgrazing there during a, a very stressful period for the plants. One of the things that's difficult to do though is, is rebuild numbers quickly and take advantage of those, of those good seasons. And I think that's probably a, probably a, a lesson or a way of managing that we, we're still trying to, to deal with and trying to understand fully.